I've been having quite a lot of letters about that very bright star-like thing seen low in the south uh, after sunset. And that is the planet Jupiter. And if you've got a telescope, you'll be able to see its cloud belts and its four bright moons. It really is most spectacular. And further over to the west, there are two more bright planets. Mars, which is still very red, although it's not so bright now as it was a few weeks ago. And above that, Saturn, where the ring system is wide open. But for the moment, comets are very much in the news. There is, of course, Halley's Comet which is still far too faint to be seen except with giant telescopes. And there's the latest picture of it. It's a negative, and the comet is that black thing right in the middle of the picture. It'll be some time yet, of course, before it comes within the range of amateur telescopes. But there are other comets, too. There was, in particular, Cromelin's comet. Now, that's different. That has a period of just over 27 years. And this photograph was taken at the UK Schmidt uh, over in Siding Spring in Australia. And note those coloured lines. And they, in fact, are stars. Because this is a composite of three different photographs, one taken with a red filter, one with the green, and one with the blue. And they were taken at slightly different times because the camera was following the comet, and therefore each star is imaged three times in three different colours. Now, Cromelin was valuable because it was going to be used as a rehearsal for the programme of Halley's Comet when it comes further in. Uh, Cromelin was never spectacular. I'm afraid that I never saw it at all from England, but still, um, it was useful, and I'll come back to that later. And then, of course, there is Enki's comet. And there's a picture of Enki, the shortest known period comet. And it goes around the sun in only three and a third years. And it's now been seen at over 50 different returns. So it's very much an old friend, although nowadays it never becomes bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. And that's been studied by the Pioneer probe, which is actually going round the planet Venus. And in ultraviolet, it looked at Enki's comet, and it discovered that Enki's comet is losing water at about three times the expected rate. And that's very interesting, because we do know, and this confirms, that comets are fairly short-lived members of the solar system, at least periodical comets are. But because we're going to hear so much about Halley's Comet over the next year or two, I thought it would be a good idea to do a program now about comets in general and missions to them. And um, I'm delighted to welcome to the sky at night, for the first time, but I certainly hope not the last, Dr. John Davis of Leicester University. Welcome to the sky at night, John. Hello. First of all, what about the nature of a comet? Well, I think the, the best way to think about a comet is as a dirty iceberg, a mile or two in diameter. Many thousands of millions of these orbit the sun in a very loose cloud uh, called Oort's cloud, which extends well beyond Pluto, thousands of times further, in fact, almost to the nearest star. Now, of course, we can't see them because they're much <laughs> too small, but if they are affected by the gravity of another star, for example, they fall in towards the sun. And as they fall in, they warm up. And as they warm up, of course, the ice starts to melt. So the dust and gas starts to blow away, form a fuzzy blob around the central core, which we call a nucleus, and the fuzzy cloud is called a coma. The coma may be distorted by the solar wind, the sunlight, blowing it away to form a tail, either a gas tail or a dust tail. And uh, then, of course, the comet goes around the sun and disappears back into deep space. Unless, of course, in the meantime, it's had a close approach to, say, Jupiter, which may move it into a shorter period orbit so it goes around much more frequently. Well, I think most people imagine that a comet travels head first, because it doesn't always. Rather interesting that. A comet's tail is made up, well, either of gas or dust, and is very much affected by the solar wind. And solar wind is a stream of low energy particles coming out from the sun in all directions. And it so happens that they affect the tail of a comet and drive it out. So a comet starts to develop a tail as it comes in toward the sun. And as it passes perihelion, or closest distance to the sun, the tail becomes as long as it ever does, and then, when perihelion is passed, and the comet starts to move out again, it starts to lose its tail, and, in fact, the tail swings, so that as the comet travels outwards, it moves tail first. So the tail always points more or less away from the sun, which, of course, not very many people appreciate. But it does demonstrate, doesn't it, John, that because a comet loses a certain amount of mass every time it comes close to the sun, it can't last for a very long time on the cosmic scale. No, we estimate that each trip round the sun causes the comet to lose a few feet of its outer layers. So, obviously, the comet must eventually fade away completely, or it may under undertake a more, a more dramatic end. <laughs> it may fall, fall into pieces, for example. Well, shades of Beeler's Comet is an interesting one. There was a short period comet called Beeler's Comet that used to go around the sun in a period of six and three quarter years. And it was seen in 1826, 1832, 1838 it was missed, 1845 it was back. And then it split into two parts. And this is a drawing of the comet made by the Italian astronomer Angelo Secchi. And you can see there are two definite comets there. Beeler's comet had split up. It then disappeared in its journey around the sun. It came back in 1852. But
The two parts were still there, but this time they were more equal and they were further apart. And uh, they then disappeared again. They weren't seen in 1858, the next return, because they were badly placed, almost behind the sun in the sky. But they should have come back in 1865. And they didn't. Despite the most intensive searches, Beeler's Comet was never seen and has never been seen again. It disappeared as completely as the Hunter of the Snark. But, of course, it did leave its mark in the form of a shower of meteors or shooting stars. Yes, obviously the, the dust which makes up the comet must still exist. It's still going around the sun in the same orbit. And if the Earth happens to intercept this cloud of particles, then we see a, a meteor shower, a stream of shooting stars all coming from more or less the same place in the sky. Well, of course, there are various other comets, too, that have disappeared. Brawson's periodical comet, that's gone. And one called Westphal, that's gone. So um, comets don't last forever. But there is, of course, a very close association between comets and shooting stars or meteors, and there's also been a suggestion, as you know, that there may be a connection between comets and those strange things we call Apollo asteroids, which are small bodies a few miles across, which come close to the Earth. And uh, you've been involved in the IRS program, and it was from IRS that a very unusual asteroid was discovered, 1983 TB, hasn't yet been given a name. And that has an orbit which carries it within nine million miles of the sun. So it must be red hot. And I just wonder, what do you think about this, John? Can that asteroid be simply a dead comet? Well, it's very interesting, because as soon as the orbit of 1983 TB was worked out, it was obvious that it coincided with the orbit of the Geminid meteors. Now, astronomers had for some years believed that the Geminids were the remains of a dead comet, a comet which had disappeared. And they'd even given this sort of mythical comet a name. They called it Fred. <laughs> Lovely idea. Strictly unofficial, of course. And when uh, they realized that 1983 TB and Fred had almost exactly the same orbit, then it was obvious to think that this might be the nucleus of the Geminid comet. It's a very interesting possibility. Well, I know. I realize it is a coincidence, but I must admit that I'm, I'm very skeptical, because after all, comets are mainly ices and very small particles. This seems to me that when a comet disrupts, it's liable to disappear completely. I don't know. I suppose it's a pure, pure literal possibility. But there are also several other asteroids, some discovered by IRS and some from the ground, that have cometary orbits. Yes, there were two other asteroids found in 1983, not by IRS, as it happens, uh, which have look as if they ought to be comets. There was 93 SA, which goes out almost as far as Jupiter, and 1983 XF, which in fact goes even further, goes out well beyond Jupiter. Now, if you look at these orbits without knowing what they are, you'd think that they were short period comets. And yet the photographs taken of these objects show them to be asteroidal, rocky objects. So we don't yet know. They may in fact be comets which are very quiet. They're just not producing very much gas and dust at the moment. And if we follow them round, we may see that when they get close to the sun, then they become more, more like a classical comet. Well, after all, there are a couple of comets that um, look ab absolutely stellar these days. And that curious thing, Hidalgo, classed as an asteroid, number 944, whose orbit takes it right from Venus out almost as far as Saturn. This shows no trace of a coma or gas. I just wonder. Hidalgo uh, will be well placed for observation in 1990, incidentally. Well, let's come back to a moment, shall we, to Halley's Comet. Um, it's um, still too faint to be seen, except with very large telescopes. But I know it's been studied from the Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona, and they've come up with a very interesting finding indeed. According to the report that I have, Halley's Comet appears to be much redder than expected. What do you make of that, John? Well, I don't think it's as surprising as you might expect, because we know that many outer solar system objects do in fact appear reddish. For example, there's the Trojan asteroids, these share Jupiter's orbit. Um, and these belong to a class of objects which are called RD objects, or simply because they're reddish and dark. So I don't think it's all that un unusual that Halley is showing RD-type colors at the moment. What is interesting is that other observers have reported rapid changes in its brightness, more than a magnitude in a night. Now, we may be seeing an effect here of a, the nucleus actually tumbling. It may be dark on one side and light on the other. Or we might be seeing the very first stages of the outgassing, the gas boiling away from the nucleus to start forming the coma. And if that's true, that's a very interesting observation. It's still a long, long way from the sun. Could be quite encouraging, too. We've been at great pains to point out that Halley's Comet this time is not going to be nearly so brilliant as it was in 1910, for example, because the Earth and the comet were in the wrong places at the wrong times. It may be rather a disappointment as a spectacle. But um, if it's behaving in this way, then it just could become a lot brighter than the pessimists expect. Comet brightnesses are very difficult to predict, if you remember what happened to Comet Kahoota. I do indeed. Um, that was the non-event of the century. Well, Halley, we're better than that, certainly. Let's hope that uh, Halley it turned out to be brighter than expected. I think it must be. You'll just see that with a naked eye. But quite apart from Halley, 1983 was a very interesting year for comets, was it not? A great many of them were under, under, uh, under observation. Yes, it was a record year, in fact. There were no less than 21 comets received designations in 1983. Uh, 
some of them were particularly interesting as well. For example, we have Comet 1983V, or Comet Hartley-IRAS, because it was found independently by IRAS and by Malcolm Hartley in Australia. That was your discovery, wasn't it, in effect? Um, yes, it was. <laughs> um, the thing about Comet uh, 1983V is its orbit. It's uh, inclined at 90 degrees to the ecliptic plane. Now, that's unusual in itself. In fact, it's slightly more than 90 degrees, so it's technically going round backwards. Well, so does Halley's. Yes, Halley's, Halley's orbit is also retrograde, as we say. But 1983V also had an outburst uh, late, early in this year, rather, and it became much brighter than we expected, and so it was uh, easily observable by amateur telescopes for some time longer than we had thought. Yes, I saw it myself. And I just wonder, is this curious orbit due to a fairly recent encounter with Jupiter? Yes, the, the preliminary orbit indicates a close approach to Jupiter in this century, and that's probably whiffed out of the plane of the planet mm. and tossed it into this unusual orbit. Then, of course, we had Aras Araki Alcock, another of your Aras discoveries, also made by Araki in Japan, and, of course, our old friend George Alcock uh, in Peterborough, and that's his fifth comet, I think, and he also discovered the Four Novi, a pretty impressive record. But that was a very interesting comet. Yes, it was very interesting for the amateur astronomers, obviously, because it was uh, visible to the naked eye. It was easy to find because it descended on the Earth almost from the North Pole, so it was visible all night. But professional astronomers found it very useful, too, even though we had very little time to get ready because yeah. it was such a surprise. Yeah. It passed very close to the Earth, of course, only 12 million miles, so it was attempts were made to bounce radar off it and uh, take lots of photographs, but we were also able to scan it from IRAS, and that produced a very interesting result because when we made maps of it with IRAS, we found evidence for a, a dust tail which was not visible in the optical. The dust was warm, so IRAS could detect it, but there wasn't enough of it to scatter visible light and make it visible to uh, people from the ground. But what about the tail of Comet Temple II? Yes, probably the most spectacular of these infrared tails, not, not visible from the ground, was uh, that found on Comet Temple II in July. If you remember, IRAS is making a, s a map of the sky, and it scans out a strip every day. What happened was, in July, we found a strip of uh, sky containing some unusual moving objects. So watched carefully the next day, and a few more cropped up, and the next day a few more cropped up. And then I, I realized that these were in a, in a line, they were pointing at something, what? As I looked and I found they were pointing at the nucleus of Comet Temple II. This was very surprising because Temple II is a periodic comet, it goes around the sun every five years. So you wouldn't expect it to have very much of a gas or dust uh, left to form a tail. And there's no visible tail uh, being reported for some time. So we waited for a week because we knew IRAS was coming back to that patch of sky in a week's time. And sure enough, a week later, we found exactly the same thing, only it had moved across the sky by just exactly the right amount uh, to be attached to the comet. So there's, there's no doubt that it is definitely attached to the comet. When you first made that discovery, did you find it rather difficult to persuade other people to believe it? Yeah, yes, I found it rather difficult to believe myself, actually. Um, on the other, the other hand, there's nothing unusual about Temple II, so it's quite possible we'll see dust tails like this on other comets when we look more closely into the IRS data. Well, what about your rehearsal comet, Cromelin? Did you get very much information from that? Yes, Comet Cromelin was set up as a practice run for Halley's Comet, and although the weather in Europe wasn't very good, we were able to get some observations from Australia and also from the UK Infrared Telescope in Hawaii, even though uh, Mauna Loa, a nearby volcano, chose that very day to erupt, which didn't make things any easier. Most inconvenient. But um, the most important thing which came out was it did uh, draw to our attention a couple of problems with our equipment and our communication. So we're able to put those things right before Halley as well as getting some good science done. And of course, with Halley's Comet, there's only one chance. All the probes are going to go by in March 1986. You know, the Americans cancelled their Halley's Comet probe, and I think they're going to be very cross with themselves for the next seven to six years. But at least there are several going up. There's the European probe, Giotto, and that's a photograph of it uh, taken at British Aerospace when it was actually being made. Then the Russians have got two probes, the Vega probes, that are going to go there by way of the planet Venus. And then the Japanese have a cut price probe, Planet A, which will stand off the comet. Well, uh, what are your main hopes for these probes, John? I think it's interesting that the, the three different uh, types of spacecraft complement each other rather nicely. Uh, Japanese Planet A will fly some distance from the comet, and that will observe the hydrogen gas corona, which forms around the comet and is invisible from the ground. The Russian Vigas will, after flying past Venus, intercept Halley and go into the coma itself where they'll probe the gas and dust composition and try to actually find the nucleus and photograph it. And then we have the European probe Giotto, which is a sort of comet kamikaze mission because it's aimed right at the very center of the comet to fly within a few hundred miles of the nucleus and to take color pictures of the nucleus itself. It'll also be making other measurements, of course, while it's in the comet, the dust and gas composition uh, again. One very encouraging point, I think, about these programs is that they are cooperative. 
uh, each probe will send back the results and make those results available to the probes coming in next. Yes, that's right. The Russians have said that they will help uh, to pass to the Europeans exactly where the nucleus is to make sure Giotto gets as close as we possibly can. Well, that I think is highly encouraging. But there are, of course, one or two other plans afoot. And I'm thinking of the American probe of Copp's Comet, dated for 1994. Well, Copp's Comet, of course, is another pure, short period comet, uh, not nearly so bright as Halley's, not visible to the naked eye. But I believe the plan is to launch a rocket to it and actually contact Copp's Comet when it's still out in the asteroid belt. And uh, in the process, it'll be able to go past a couple of asteroids, Namakwa and Lucia, and survey those. It'll then literally catch up Copp's Comet, and as the comet draws in toward the sun and starts to become active, uh, the probe will keep pace with it. So it'll be able to stay with it, possibly, for a period of several years and carry out long, continued experiments. And that, I think, will be highly informative. So let's hope that works. But even before that, uh, there's the rather amazing plan of using an existing satellite to take it away from its present path and use that to rendezvous with yet another periodical comet, Giacobini Zimmer. Yes, NASA realized a few years ago that their Earth orbiting spacecraft, IC3, the International Sun Earth Explorer, could be diverted by some rather clever maneuvering, including some very close approaches to the moon, to fly off into space and intercept Comet Jacobini Zinner and do it before any of the other probes reach Halley. So they're hoping to get back some scientific information from Jacobini Zinner and at the same time beat all the other nations to a comet. Really is rather amazing. They've been able to uh, make use of a satellite that has been in orbit around the Earth for a long time. It's very economical. Now, I just wonder, what do you think of the chances of success of any of these probes? I'm very optimistic. It's a very difficult experiment, but I, I'm hopeful that at least some of the probes will give us very interesting results. Well, up to now, we've known very little about a comet's nucleus, because every time a comet comes into the sun, it hides itself behind a kind of a screen. So with any luck at all, at least some of these probes over the next few months should tell us a great deal more about the makeup of a comet than we ever known before. So I imagine for you, John, it's a very, very much of an exciting time. It's a very exciting thing. And meanwhile, Comet Halley is coming closer to the sun all the time still well beyond the range of any but giant telescopes. It's going to be the middle of next year before amateur-owned telescopes have much chance of picking it up. And then, of course, it'll brighten quite quickly. And round about November of 1985, it should become visible with the naked eye. We can't be absolutely certain about this because you cannot forecast the brightness of a comet with anything like accuracy, but with any luck it will be so. It will certainly be visible with binoculars, and it should brighten again during December. It then goes round the sun and reaches perihelion on February the 9th. And then, of course, it's going to be out of view. And when it uh, comes round from the far side of the sun, it should then, in fact, be at its brightest. Although, unfortunately, it's then going to be well south of the sun, and we're not going to see it from here. So if you want to see it well, go down to somewhere such as South Africa or Australia. But then it does come north again, and it'll again be a fairly prominent object round about April. And then it'll fade quite quickly, and before long, a small telescopes will lose it, with big telescopes, we should follow it till about 1990 or even later than that, and then it'll be gone for another 76 years. But by then, it may have told us a great deal. And finally, we come to the newsletter. Number 14 is now ready, so if you want it, please send a stamped address envelope to Newsletter Number 14, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12HQT. I'll repeat that, Newsletter Number 14, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12HQT and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. And meanwhile, from John and myself and all those comets, good night. edition of the sky and that edition of the sky at night can be seen on bbc2 at 10 past three next saturday evening at 7:45, james burke presents a horizon special beyond the moon which recalls the momentous events of 15 years ago which culminated in two men stepping onto the surface of the moon and also looks forward to the future of space travel that's next saturday at seven sky at night